Čujemo. Čujemo se. Super. 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 Dobar dan svima. Moje ime je Saša Solujić i zaista mi je veliko... Good morning everyone, my name is Saša Solujić and I have a great pleasure to facilitate the webinar Global Megatrends Shaping the Future of Bosnia and Herzegovina. This webinar takes place within the project implemented in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Sustainable Transition of Bosnia and Herzegovina, PH Sutra. The project is funded by the Swedish government in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I warmly welcome all the participants who are with us today and who have gathered in this virtual space from different locations, different places in Bosnia and Herzegovina, neighboring countries, and including many colleagues from Sweden who are eager to hear about this topic. As the host of this webinar, I would like to share with you a couple of uh, notes uh, and rules. My three colleagues, Anneli, Bora, and Ayla, will provide technical support. And if you have any problems during the webinar, you can write to them. They will uh, place the messages in our joint chat. If we have a problem with Zoom, we will have a live stream on Facebook. Today, in this webinar, we will explore very interesting topics, how megatrends affect Bosnia and Herzegovina against the backdrop of climate action, and how and whether we can shape the future. Just briefly, I will share with you today's agenda. This is the one we sent to you when you registered for this webinar. Let me see. Bear with me for a moment. And if I may ask for assistance of my colleagues to share the agenda. Technica. Je nešto što će nas uvek u prvom momentu izdati kada ne planiramo. We always expect some technical issues. Regardless of all preparations. Can you confirm if you see the presentation? No. Never mind, we will... Deal with this in the, in the break. Uh, so we have the same agenda that uh, was shared with you. We have two interesting uh, presentations of my colleagues uh, from the SCI and three extremely interesting panelists from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now I will give the floor to my colleague, Robert Watt. He is our engagement director, and he will welcome you on behalf of the Stockholm Environment Institute. Sasha, thank you so much. And a very warm welcome, everybody, uh, at uh, this webinar. One 
So now we see. Can you hear us now? Yes, they can hear it. So now you can start, Rob. Well, okay. Thank you very much, everybody, um, for bearing with us with some technical uh, issues as we get started. But uh, my name is Robert Watt. I'm SCI's Engagement Director, and it is a huge pleasure uh, to provide a few opening remarks uh, to this absolutely fascinating webinar. Um, what I want to do, actually, when I'm providing these remarks is, is to reflect a little bit on the topic and the theme of trends from the perspective of SCI, uh, not only from, if you like, our history, but also from recent efforts that we have made to think about the future, our own insight and foresight. But let me just introduce SEI. Um, so SEI, um, Stockholm Environment Institute, is bridging science, policy, and practice. We are an international nonprofit research and policy organization that tackles environment and development challenges. And we connect science and the research that we carry out with decision making. And we do that to develop solutions for a sustainable future for all. We've been doing this since 1989. Uh, and 1989 was, of course, a very momentous year, not only because it was the year uh, in which SEI was established, but because of many other very significant events that took place, not least in Europe. For me, certainly in my lifetime, that's probably the most significant year. But since then, SEI has really seen some very large trends emerge. When SEI started, we were a relatively small, almost niche organization working at this interface between environment and development. But since then, we've actually grown as an organization, grown in terms of our geographic locations, in terms of the number of people, but also in the agendas on which we work. And we've seen things uh, like uh, the environmental issues related to air pollution, which we were working on in the early 1990s, expand and grow to be much more about uh, energy transitions, industry transitions, climate change, of course, while still we work on issues related to food security uh, and uh, access to water, uh, for example. So I think that what I'm trying to get at here is that since 1989, there has been a huge expansion, and in a positive sense, an expansion in the agenda around environmental sustainability. Perhaps, you know, that is seen in the development from thinking in terms of millennium development goals to sustainable development goals to the uh, creation of a climate regime at the Paris uh, Climate Summit in 2015 which really is beginning to see some very major shifts in the allocation of capital in the development and deployment of new technologies. So the trend that I'm trying to, that sort of big macro trend I'm trying to get across that has you know, been part of the SEI story is our perspective is, is a broadly progressive and positive one, one where sustainability went from niche to mainstream. And that has an even early history. The reason why we're called SEI, Stockholm Environment Institute, has nothing to do actually with the city of Stockholm, beautiful as it is. It's because back in 1972, um, there was a, the first UN conference on uh, human development and the environment, and it took place in Stockholm. And in fact, the Swedish parliament's decision to establish SEI was their effort to follow up and realize the promises, the ambitions of the Stockholm Declaration that was agreed back in 1972. So that's also another link to this broader trend. First 1972, then 1989, and all of those progresses that have been made. But I want to just pause for a moment because those other momentous events in 1989 the fall of the Berlin Wall, are also an important part of our history. One of the first uh, places that SEI set up a, a new center was in Estonia, in Tallinn, in 1992. And we have a long commitment in history of working together with countries 
as they stake out a pathway to sustainable development, to being you know, part of that global family uh, of, of countries committed to democracy and sustainability. And that commitment still is there. We are still in Estonia. We have a centre there that has been supporting recently the Estonian government as it tries to uh, work out how to reach a net zero future by the middle of the century. And what we did, looking into the future, trying to think about what sort of developments in all economic centers would be, all economic sectors would be required to reach that net zero target. And, and that work, that analysis, then enabled the Estonian government to feel the confidence and have the, um, if you like, the backing and the evidence to be able to support the European Union's uh, net zero goals. And that's a very good example of the sort of work that SEI does applying you know, locally relevant context and insight, applying our tools and our knowledge and our expertise to really support decision makers in making some pretty momentous choices. And we're doing that across the world. So uh, one of the things that makes SEI unique is the fact that we now have eight centers yeah. on five continents and over 300 experts that can cover topics ranging from climate change to energy, to water, to food, you name it. Uh, uh, we, we probably can cover it. It's easier to say what we don't do than what we do. Um, and then I just wanted to perhaps say something briefly about our more recent efforts to look into the future. And uh, I mean, future gazing is a centuries old human urge. Um, crystal balls, using uh, that English expression of looking into a crystal ball. Crystal balls have been owned by fourth century uh, Merovingian kings and 19th century Chinese emperors. And even the 16th century mathematician, Dr. John Dee, chose the date of Elizabeth I's coronation based on uh, looking into the uh, star charts and interpreting the future and the most uh, opportune moment for that coronation. And these days, governments, militaries, companies are constantly on the lookout for trends. And they loop that foresight back into the planning that they make now, the infrastructure that they seek to uh, invest in. But what does SEI have to offer here? Well, you know, we try and squint into the future as much as we can. We try and work out what's in our crystal ball. And there are a couple of things that make us perhaps able to do that in a way that's different from others. One, of course, is the fact that we have these eight offices located all over the world. And we can do that by, by what that means is we can look at trends starting to local and regional reality uh, and link that to a global uh, uh, set of trends, but also global decision making. And the other thing is our, our breadth of expertise. We really do have leading experts in such a wide range of scientific fields. Now, over the last few years, we've come up with a number of trends um, uh, that we think are, are critical in influencing sustainability. Most recently, we talked about the likelihood that we would be breaking through that um, 1.5 degrees centigrade barrier already during this year. And what does that mean in terms of how societies and governments would react to limit overshoot in both size and duration? We talked also about the fact that there is a great race towards resources in the lands and on the ocean, in, in, on the land and in the ocean, a race for land, for energy, to access critical raw materials, but also to ensure food security. And we've also talked about other critical trends that we see breaking the surface, sometimes to disrupt, sometimes to accelerate the sustainability transitions. That might be 
rethinking multilateralism, the role of AI, and how populism is influencing decision making. And that brings me a little bit back to the current situation we find us in and today's webinar. This webinar is taking place at a time of, of uncertainty and turbulence amid rapid technological transformations, geopolitical tensions and a war in Europe that continues to upend the lives of individuals and the economies of nations. Those long-term trends that I spoke of in sustainability are actually having an effect and it is perhaps no surprise, we, or we shouldn't be surprised that perhaps there is now something of a backlash as the deep, deep transformations in energy systems, in the jobs of the future, in communities are beginning to be felt and need to be managed carefully. Our job today is not just to spot trends and identify those that are vulnerable to the winds of change, it is also to be trendsetters and to be agents of change. I wish you all the best for today's webinar and we're we'll listening in with real interest. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rob, for your excellent presentation of our institution and contribution to various initiatives related to environment protection. Uh, SAI exists for a long time, and we are trying to capitalize on our knowledge. Uh, Rob is well, uh, very well aware of what is going on on in BNH, and he was uh, participating in a large conference last September. So I do hope that you will um, keep that interest in this region, in this country. Uh, Rob mentioned that we always wanted to know how the future will look like, starting from uh, looking into the crystal balls and others. But today we have more sophisticated methods that are based on scientific methods, say, is um, research institute. So we are going to use a more systematic way to present. How can we envisage, how can we forecast uh, and predict future or certain elements of that? And uh, how can we decide on something today that can have positive impact impact on us. Sara Talabian is um, a, a research associate, let's say, with a large experience in applying these tools and methodologies that enhance uh, and help um, decision making in um, uncertain times. And she works uh, also and focus on climate and climate change. Sara, please floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sasha. If I just share my screen here. Could you see my screen now? Yes. Amazing. You're more All right. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us in this webinar. My name is Sarah Talibian, and I'm with Stockholm Environment Institute, working with future-oriented approaches and scenario development and planning. Uh, today, I will be talking about how we can shape the future by exploring various possibilities and pathways. So the future is inherently uncertain and cannot be predicted. We can prop and identify a range of events and possibilities that might happen in the future, but we cannot say which ones will emerge and unfold with complete accuracy. But however, by exploring alternative futures, we can understand what is within the realm of possible and work on achieving those futures that are desirable 
and desirable outcomes for our societies. So in this session, we will delve into how we can study and influence the future and what is what and why that is important for making just, effective, and robust policies. So what is the future? The future is simply the potential then the later than now will arrive time-wise and some events and phenomena will happen in that time horizon. But that future cannot exist in the present, obviously. So anticipation is the only way that the future is actually expressed in the present. So the future is what we imagine, what we think it to be. Some futures are possible or plausible, meaning that we believe they might or could happen. Some are perceived as probable because we think that they are more likely to materialize in the time later than now. And some futures are preferable or desirable, which means that they depict a future imaginary that we want to happen later. So future, oh, sorry. So futures, or better say, our perceptions and imaginations of different types of futures is made of three key elements. Trends or observable patterns or tendencies in various domains that are likely to continue towards the same direction over time. Examples for trends are digital economy, for example, or the increasing importance of digital platforms and currencies in our economies, or technological developments and the increasing integration of AI, artificial intelligence across different sectors. Emerging issues are nascent problems or opportunities that are not yet fully understood or recognized, but they have the potential to significantly impact the future and our societies in the future. For example, we see increasing private interest in space exploration, or we hear about concerns over a global mental health crisis, but these are just beginning to rise on the horizon and their direction and development and how they might unfold and impact our societies in the future are yet to be explored. Finally, wild cards or black swans as we call them are highly unforeseen events with very low probability but very high impact. This means that if they happen, they can dramatically alter the course of future developments, but we perceive them as very unlikely. Examples for black swans are major geopolitical shocks, like let's say breaking wars or sudden changes in leadership at the global scale, or finding life in the outer space or other galaxies. These are surprising events very unlikely, we perceive them to be very unlikely, but upon their occurrence, they can deeply change societies. The future is driven by a combination of these different types of drivers, some already known, some we can already anticipate and sort of foresee how they will develop in future. Some are new, challenging, and some are completely unknown and surprising to us. So then the question is why the future is important, especially for policy making and for different policy domains. Why does it matter that we understand the future and its driving forces? There are three key reasons for why the future and its characteristics are important for policy and policy making in the present time. First, we know that today's policies have far reaching consequences affecting not just the present, but also future generations. So in order to make just equitable decisions that address both the present and future generations and challenges they face, and of course, safeguard future generations right, right to the planet, right to resources, right to peaceful societies, we need to navigate the future and future possibilities when we are making policies now. The second reason is that the future is uncertain and complex. 
we can explore and identify a range of future possibilities, but we cannot predict which one would happen. So then a policy that is effective to address one future possibility might not perform well in responding to another future alternative or future challenge. So we need to explore and anticipate a wide range of future possibilities, challenges, and opportunities to be able to make robust policies in the face of future uncertainties, policies that can effectively address a wide range of future events and developments. And finally, we know that we can influence, we can shape our future by making appropriate, suitable, effective policies and measures today. So it is important to understand what is it that we wanna shape and influence. It is important to understand the future and plan for transformation towards the future outcomes that are desirable for our societies and economies, and of course, livelihoods. So the next step would be to try to figure out how we can think about the future, how we can explore the future and understand it. In general, there are two ways or main approaches to think about and like conceptualize the future and use the information we gather through those approaches about future in policy processes. In other words, future-oriented approaches usually answer to two key questions. The first question is, what could happen in future? And by answering to this question, we discuss and develop exploratory imaginaries of future possibilities. And the second question is what should happen? What we want to happen in future? And when we answer to this question, it helps us to structure and form our value judgments and create normative imaginaries and pictures of desirable features of the, of the outcomes in future that we want. So with this like overarching approach, we can understand that exploratory futures focus on understanding what could happen, possibilities. This involves understanding the future through investigating alternatives, alternative images of the future for different communities, for different sectors, for different parts of the society. And usually exploratory approaches use methods and techniques like scenario planning to imagine various potentials in the future, risk assessment to evaluate potential risks and opportunities under alternative future contexts, and develop adapti adaptive strategies that can be adjusted as we gather new information and as new emerging issues actually emerge in our time horizon. And then complementary to that exploratory approach, normative futures are about influencing and shaping the future. This involves defining what is desirable and what are the pathways and roads to achieve these desired outcomes. Normative approaches to future thinking usually use tools and processes to vision and set long-term goals and objectives define actionable strategies to achieve those ob objectives, and of course, advocate for and enable policies that align with those desired outcomes. And obviously, when it comes to policy processes and policy making, to effectively explore, prepare for, and influence the future, we need to integrate these approaches. We need both exploratory and normative approaches and integrate them into policy processes. This, help, this helps policymakers to understand and assess future opportunities and challenges, prepare for those that are out of their sphere of operation and control and influence. So there's, there are things happening in future, like for example, global megatrends, that we cannot influence in a meaningful way as policymakers at national or local or regional level, but we can prepare our context for those mega threats. And finally, there are aspects of the future that we can actually control, we can leverage, we can influence, we can shape them. So this would be the third 
part of a future oriented approach to policy making at present. Just to give you a few examples, Policymakers at different levels of governance are increasingly incorporating future-oriented approaches into their decision-making processes. For example, the European Strategy and Policy Analysis System is an EU-level body that aims to identify and analyze global trends and challenges that the EU is likely to face over the next decades. They use future-oriented approaches, just like the ones that we mentioned here, to produce reports and policy briefs and scenario analyses that inform the strategic planning of EU institutions, different EU institutions at different levels. The European Commission's strategy, Strategic Foresight Report is another example of high-level EU efforts to ensure policies are sort of future-proof and they integrate a future-oriented approach throughout. At the national level, also, there are many examples, many countries within Europe and beyond have adopted, have adopted future-oriented approaches in policymaking to address complex challenges and shape their future. Challenges like global environmental change, climate change, environmental degradation, and similar to that, like big challenges that we need future-oriented approaches to address them. Another example is Finland. The government of Finland has a department called the Government Foresight Group that is dedicated to integrate future, future approaches into all levels of policy making to ensure a prepared Finland for future challenges. The Dutch Future Age Agenda, for example, in the Netherlands, uses foresight to anticipate and prepare for future societal and environmental challenges. And many, many more examples, both at the national scale and sectoral levels in, for example, the UK, France, Sweden, Germany, and many other countries. So policymakers at different national, at different levels of governance at national and global scale are trying more and more to incorporate these approaches into their policy cycles and day-to-day -day policy processes and decision-making. So I'm not gonna talk much more, just I wanna conclude what I talked about with saying that shaping the future requires a structured approach that integrates perceptions, possibilities, and concerns about the future into all stages of policy cycle. By leveraging both exploratory and normative features, we can make informed decisions that are robust against future uncertainties and at the same time align with our long-term goals. So it is usually recommended to countries, regions, organizations, and even companies in private sector at different scales of ambition and operation to do so by, for example, establishing dedicated teams units or long-term programs within the government or an organization responsible specifically for conducting foresight activities and for ensuring that future-oriented approaches are integrated across different policy scales and domains. Developing and regularly updating future scenarios helps the continuous explorations of future possibilities, risks, op opportunities, and other challenges that the policies we make today need to address. Using future-oriented decision support tools or expert knowledge or data can help policymakers to map out different pathways towards future and their potential outcomes, helping to clarify future implications, costs and benefits of today's decisions and policies. And finally, collaboration. Collaboration is key in future-oriented approaches and activities. Collaboration between government departments and agencies engage, engaging with private sector and their expertise and resources. And collaborating also with international organizations, networks, and initiatives could all help policymakers to learn from best practices and develop cohesive future-oriented policies and strategies appropriate to their context and their day-to-day -day job. 
So I'm going to wrap up my presentation here. Thank you so much for your attention and for your for listening to me. I think I now hand over to Sasha again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sara, for this uh, indeed an exceptional overview and summary of technologies and approaches to future and how we transition from normative to transformative planning. Um, I uh, have only one conclusion. It uh, resonated with me that the decisions we make today affect future, and that is something that we all need to have in mind. Uh, we very often uh, discuss uh, uh, long-term goals, what will happen in 2030, 2050, but in order to make it happen, we need to sit down today and to make solid decisions. Thank you very much, Sara. Now I will hand over to our colleague Markus. Markus will discuss the mega trend, uh, long term trends uh, that occur at a global level and, in essence, you cannot affect them largely. You can compare them with years, cannot easily be moved or changed. They're not under our direct control. Markus is a senior fellow research at uh, SEI. He has been addressing the, uh, the issues that link uh, science policy and practice for more than 30 years. And he is exploring how institutions and humans organize themselves and respond to some urgent situation for occurrences. Uh, you can look at our website. Uh, Marcus uh, recently got her, his uh, first uh, granddaughter, so he, now, he became grandfather. Congratulations. He has been grandfather for two years now. To present us the global megatrends that are affecting EU and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Well, thank you, Sasha. I heard uh, my name mentioned quite a few times in your your uh, introduction, so I will I will not describe who I am and trust that that's been done. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, Sarah has uh, generously uh, offered to run the slides for me, so I will let you know as we go along. Uh, about the slides, my uh, training is as a sociologist. So I'm very interested in the environmental changes coming at us uh, that we're driving, but also how we're responding to those. And uh, of course, people are hardwired to look around and see what seems to be working and copy that as best we can. So um, the, uh, my task is to run through these megatrends. It'll be a whirlwind tour. Uh, there are 14 of them. Uh, and each of those megatrends actually is made up of, a, of multiple uh, trends themselves that fall within a similar category. So each of these we could dive down into and spend quite a bit of time on. And over the course of uh, the morning here, we will dig into three of them uh, a little bit more deeply that have been selected out based on what we know to be a concern uh, to all of you in, uh, in the region. Uh, one point that I can raise here is this image uh, is an AI-generated image. I asked for an inspirational, idealized image of Sarajevo, and this is what uh, AI <coughs> provided for me. So uh, next slide. We'll come back to that in just a moment. So uh, a couple of caveats. Some of these 14 megatrends are obviously likely to be more important to the region uh, than, than other megatrends. Some of them are more desirable. Uh, some are more things that we would like to avoid. As I say, three have been selected for, uh, pre-selected for closer examination. But one thing to consider as we run through these is which of them uh, you expect might be especially influential that we may not have included in that, uh, in that series. Not all of them are equally impactful. Not all of them are equally actionable, uh, but they're all important. And 
let me just say about the European Commission, uh, there are two links provided in the materials here that will take you to the Megatrends hub, which is where I pulled this information and will allow you to dig in much more deeply to those megatrend issues that you're especially interested in or, or worried about. Okay, on to the next slide. So the first of the megatrends illustrated by the, the image earlier is the accelerating technological change and hyper connectivity. And examples include computing power, the data integration, artificial intelligence, social media, and its impact on how we communicate types of message, messages and issues that easily spread tools for problem solving. So there are an enormous number of developments that come with this technological change. And it's not just information technology, it's our other forms of technology as well. Next slide. These, uh, these slides will point out some of the key subcomponents of the megatrends uh, that are included. And one of the, so if you look to the left of the diagram here, it'll show you the research that's been done previously that's fed into the ass assessment of what the new megatrends are. And in the dark blue area, uh, it is the developments that are underway currently that we see. So great power, great risk. We understand that coming with artificial intelligence. Uh, there are questions about how this changes our actual realities, uh, enhancing life through forms of technology. I have an Apple Watch. That watch warned me a couple of years ago about, a, about an irregular heartbeat that needed attention, uh, which technology also allowed me to get fixed. Uh, so that it's it's quite striking the kinds of changes uh, that are taking place in in that kind of technology competition in space, and it, where it talks about making a twin transition. We have virtual reality and we have our actual reality, and how will those things fit together? Next slide, please. So the second is aggravating resource scarcity. Uh, and if we move on to, well, humanity's well-being depends on our access to a range of resources, not only the mineral resources that we often talk about, but also uh, resources that we require from our environment, food, clean water, clean air, uh, to breathe. And we've reached a point where we are threatening the availability of some of those resources, either through overuse or through the pollution that we create. Next slide, please. So we're creating a range of pressures on these resources. We're finding new sources in some, some instances. We're learning that we will need to change our behavior. Uh, this links to one of the later mega trends around consumption. Uh, we are learning ways to manage those resources differently through things like circular economy and also through assumptions of sufficiency rather than maximizing our use of those resources. Next slide, please. The changing nature of work. Um, we've seen enormous shifts, for example, just through the changes that took place through the pandemic. Uh, three, four years ago, we might have, we would have certainly had more difficulty doing, doing this kind of a, a webinar. Uh, we might have tried to do this in person, for example. But there are other uncertainties and changes that come, come with, with that. So, for example, this digital transformation uh, has had enormous impacts on how we work, what our expectations are. There are other kinds of expectations um, and changes that shift the organization of work, uh, including mobility, for example. There are many of us who are not working in the countries in which we were born. Uh, and that kind of mobility and uh, ability to shift our location is, is changed, has changed quite a bit over the last few years and is changing increasingly rapidly. And a third is purpose-driven work where we're looking for more than taking home a paycheck. We're looking often for other kinds of meaning in the work that we do that 
contributes to society or contributes to our other, other social goals. Next slide, please. Security has obviously shifted the way that we think about security, uh, not least uh, changed in, uh, in the makeup of the, uh, the conflicts in uh, the war in Ukraine, um, the conflict in Israel and Gaza, but other kinds of threats. Uh, next slide here. Thank you. And those are included in a variety of different ways. Some of it is in the way that conflicts are fought, uh, some in the way that um, the nature of the threats that that uh, that are out there, they come not only from uh, from state actors, but from non-state actors with sabotage, um, the, the kinds of um, uh, hacking that have gone with our internet, our electronic facilities, the uh, takeover of uh, billing systems and information systems for hospitals or municipalities. So the, the nature of threats has shifted. The uh, geopolitical landscape has shifted now with, with uh, this erosion or disappearance of the East-West um, polarization that has been present through most of the, most of the post-war years. And those have restructured the, the whole, our whole ways of thinking about security and will continue to shift in the future. Next slide. Climate change is uh, maybe more than an elephant in the room. We know that climate change is moving rapidly. Uh, our ability to mitigate climate change has not kept up with the need. And there are other forms of environmental damage that are taking place as a result of climate change or in parallel with climate change that we're also needing to manage biodiversity loss for example, and uh, waste or other components. Next slide. Oops, uh, back up just one step with climate change. So uh, along with, now I'm a little, if you back up, no, backwards. <laughs> We're going ahead too, too quickly. There we go. Back to, okay, one forward and one more. There we go. No, you're overshot. She has a problem. Okay, there. now we're at it. So hold, hold that there. Uh, what we can, what we know is coming with climate change are all sorts of disturbances in the ecosystems that we depend on for our food supply, um, in the uh, the heat waves that we've been seeing, extreme weather conditions that threaten our cities and threaten the countryside, and are also challenging us to change practices that we're going to need to to manage if we're if we're going to bring it under control. And again, it's not only climate change itself that's a problem; it's the other changes that come in parallel or that are driven by climate change. And we'll go into that a little more in, in detail in one our uh, expert presentations here. The next mega trend is continuing urbanization. There's been an enormous shift uh, of population from rural areas to cities that's been driven by uh, the shift of jobs. It's been driven by mechanization in agriculture and a number of other factors. Next slide. That has resulted in a concentration of populations in, in big cities that calls for different ways of governing, uh, different ways of gaining participation, and also looking for ways to green our cities to make them more uh, accessible on foot in ways that they haven't often have not been. And um, managing our cities to uh, also be able to adapt to unexpected shocks as well as we uh, might operate in our prediction of things that, that could be coming in the future. There are still wild cards or black swans that we're not prepared for, and our cities need to be able to, uh, to handle those. Next slide, please. Diversification of education and learning 
uh, the days of straight uh, rows of desks and uh, teachers standing in front of the classroom lecturing with uh, and writing on the blackboard are long behind us. We've learned that that's not the best way to educate. <laughs> we have many other tools for educating and many other channels uh, for learning. Uh, and uh, if we will move to the next slide here. So there are new modes of learning. Uh, the, uh, the information that we get changes much more quickly. We have uh, artificial intelligence and uh, transformation of schools and uh, modes of teaching, modes of uh, addressing information to individuals that are shifting very rapidly. And those modes need to keep up with the pace of change, but, uh, but they also help to accelerate the changes taking place. Next slide. Widening inequalities. This is a huge challenge at the same time that we're better at dealing with many inequalities. Uh, we have others that are persisting. Inequalities in education, uh, the labor market, health, these are all increasing. Gender equality has improved, but, it's, but there are still huge gaps in important places. Territorial inequalities, for example, between North and South, uh, and global North and South still persist. Next slide. And those growing inequalities create tensions uh, that, uh, that have to be man managed. And those tensions are also a source of new conflicts. Uh, there are health inequalities, social cohesion becomes more difficult as, as we look around us and see others, particularly, for example, in cities, we look around us and see others who have you know, access to resources that we don't have. Uh, and uh, that we would like, and we're not, you know, it's unclear why those differences exist. They create new demands for societal change. Next slide, please. Expanding influence of East and South. Um, we know that the uh, influence of the global South as it develops economically, socially, in terms of education, and the expansion of China as a force both in, in security terms, but also in terms of its consumption uh, are having a huge impact on the globe and a huge impact on the uh, resource allocation around the globe. Next slide, please. And we see some of the elements of that. Uh, the international order is shifting. Africa's growth potential is changing the way that the planet's balances are uh, with use of resources and expectations for distribution of resources should take place. Ch China's economic growth is having huge in impacts on uh, access to, to resources and on consumption. And the fragmentation of globalization is taking place um, because of the, the differing pace and the differing access to resources is it's having an impact on where things go. Next slide, please. Consumption is one of these enormous drivers uh, that um, is changing rapidly. Obviously, the countries in the global north are consuming much, much more of it's having an impact on resource use, on climate change, on biodiversity. Uh, and at the same time, consumption is increasing in the developing countries where people have more, more money, more access to food and other kinds of resources. Next slide. And we will need to shift our modes of consumption toward, um, toward ways of consumption that produce satisfaction without having a huge global impact or a huge impact on our environment. So for example, there's much more discussion about sustainable consumption and how we can shift our, uh, how we can shift our modes of consumption to things that, that give us joy, but don't give us the damage that comes with, with overconsumption. Next slide. Demographic imbalances. The demographic that I'm part of and heading into is getting larger at the same time that uh, the uh, demographic, particularly in Northern countries, 
of young people is shifting that has huge consequences for how the economy supports older people. For example, people who've moved out of the labor force. Go ahead on to the next slide. Global population is growing, age structure is shifting, the labor force uh, is shifting with young people moving into other kinds of jobs. Aging creates different demands on the economy, for example, in terms of healthcare and services for, for older people. And those demographic changes also bring with it new kinds of inequality. Next slide. New systems of governance um, are having a huge impact on how we make decisions. Uh, people are able to influence the way that we, that we think about the nature of the problems uh, through other kinds of channels that pull people together. Uh, next slide, please. Those channels are um, having an impact on the political debate, debates that we have. For example, this decoupling of trusted sources from what's actually verifiable in terms of reality, what's true and what's not. Uh, Decision-making that's automated in, in ways that, uh, that are interesting. The media is under huge pressure with conventional media that's provided a filter uh, and fact-checking, being under financial pressure, collective intelligence represented in, for example, the development of AI and other kinds of innovations in government and finding ways to include people. Uh, things that we're, this, mega, this, this um, webinar is, is an example of these. All of these mix up the ways traditionally that we've had to uh, bring people together and include them in decision making. Next slide, please. Significance of migration. Uh, we hear more and more about the impacts of migration. There, next slide, please. Thank you. There are different drivers now with migration, including climate change, food shortages, militarization of borders, what's called the instrumentalization of migration where people are being pushed into other places and the attraction from countries that are developed where there are job opportunities and opportunities that have always been there uh, in more developed countries for people to provide from their, for their families but the transport modes are easier to get there. And the complexity of governing migration, uh, both the push and the pull of migration. Next slide. And health challenges. Living longer, living better, being able to manage certain kinds of health challenges uh, is creating new challenges for our economies. Uh, new challenges for how we prioritize resources and decision-making. Next slide. Uh, questions about how we deal with aging, how we extend our lifespans, how we manage an environment that, um, that helps us to stay healthy. The, uh, the new health challenges that come with having too much food that produces, that has very few nutritional qualities, uh, Obesity, for example, is a huge challenge in developed countries. Um, how we manage our own health, the, uh, the access to more and more information and more and more health services. Okay, to the next slide. So uh, thank you for uh, listening through this uh, whirlwind tour of different slides. Again, I would recommend if you are interested in digging in to what we've only touched on superficially, the European Commission's website, uh, Megatrends website is a great source to go into those areas where you are uh, especially interested and can then consider what are the, the megatrends that are most powerful, most important, most relevant, most actionable, and how to, to deal with those. So Thanks. any questions? Yeah. Thank you, Marcus, very much. This was really super interesting, and I think it opens further questions rather than just understanding the matter. It keeps uh, digging into thinking more. 
I see two questions, one in a chat from Irem. Koji od megatrendova po mišljenju prezentera predstavljaju najveću pretnju za Evropu, ako bi mogo da se rangira po prioritetima koje bi tri najveća bila? So, Marcus, if you can, according to your opinion, rank which three of the megatrends are mm -hmm. the most important for Europe. Not an easy... Irem did not give an easy task at this moment. <laughs> yeah, and I, I would prefer not to bias... Uh, our participants here <laughs> with uh, with a perspective, but I, I would say um, what I would say about these priorities with the megatrends is that there, there are interactions between the megatrends, we'll come back to this, uh, that are either reinforcing of the goals that we might have, that Sarah pointed to, for example, the, the normative goals, how we would prefer to steer them, there are also differences in the consequences uh, for these megatrends and uh, the time frame. Some of them are coming much more quickly than, than others. Uh, and I have worked around climate change and the social response to climate, climate change quite a bit. And this is one of those megatrends that is uh, clearly in the pipeline and that if we don't uh, rather quickly figure out how to shift our energy sources uh, and our other uses that uh, other activities that produce greenhouse gases, we will set things in motion that are irreversible for, for many decades, if not centuries to come. Uh, so one serious concern for our grandchildren and beyond is that we, we uh, follow the Hippocratic Oath and first do no harm. And that would uh, require taking action on things where our social act, our human activities are in influencing the environment and ecosystems that we depend on for life support. That's not only climate change, but climate change is sort of poster child for, the, for those. Sasha, did you have another question? Or? Yes, there is a one. Uh, let me just read from Q&A. Uh, if you could comment on the recent statement. Uh, so we are at the crossroads. Green transition is faltering, not just from slow progress, but from growing fatigue. Nuclear energy is a key ally in the fight against climate change, and it is crucial for balanced energy mix. This statement refers to the upcoming nuclear renaissance, especially to fusion, fusion energy. If you could provide a couple of comments related to that. Za sve naše ostale kolegi i koleginice koji su na webinaru u ovoj sekciji... For all the others colleagues in Q&A, there is description in a local language. I just read the question in English to speed up the process. So... Uh, I guess a couple of quick thoughts about this energy challenge in nuclear energy. Uh, one, and I'll try to present those without my own uh, my own biases. Number one, we need to move much faster than nuclear energy. We need to fill in energy sources much faster than what we'll be able to do uh, strictly with nuclear. I would observe that many long-term environmentalist and opponents of nuclear energy because of the risks connected with it uh, have shifted position, not because they like nuclear energy, but because they see climate change as a bigger threat than, uh, than uh, nuclear accidents. Um, nuclear accidents are clearly still a threat. One of the threats that comes from the U Russian invasion of Ukraine, for example, is uh, Zaporizhia and the the dangers connected to um, to using that as a as a threat, for example. But we're talking a ten to fifteen year time frame for bringing uh, nuclear plants online, and, and uh, you know, we need to move much more rapidly. So some of the other sources that are developing quickly um, are going to also be a very important part of that mix. Thank you, Much Mark. longer discussion, but uh, just a couple of thoughts, time frame and, and uh, 
that uh, we need to consider which threats are most uh, urgent and present. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, do we have more questions at this moment? I do not see in chat. Isla, do you have any other insight? Did I make it to share my screen? Do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Our session two. Thank you, Marcus and Sara, for your truly interesting presentations and insights from your rich and vast uh, research experience. Um, it is very interesting to be taken into account, uh, not only for the future, but uh, for the present time. It should be and become a habit to use various tools as Mark said in our internal discussion, we have a roadmaps for different, very ambitious goals that we want to achieve. However, we are building those pathways. They are not paved completely, so it's not easy to know whether we are going to take the highway or the, or the local road. But um, we are building those roads and those tools can help us a lot nowadays. Ira stole my question, but she didn't know this question will be posed. I wanted to ask all of you on webinar, what do you believe? What are the mega trends that are most important and relevant for Bosnia and Herzegovina? We um, um, did not take all 14 mega trends, but we uh, narrowed it down. So we will start Menti so you can vote, scan QR code on your phone, or log in into Menti and type in the code 65663668. And please rank what do you believe, what mega trends are the most relevant for Bosnia and Herzegovina? and we'll give you a minute or two so you can all vote and then we can switch over to the panel discussion. We will see live how things are changing as you vote. This vote will be repeated at the end. So maybe we will see uh, whether you change your opinion after the discussion. Okay, Demokra demografia je solidno prvo mesto. Demography is number one. Climate change follows. Energy jumped to number three. I, I feel like I'm um, commenting Olympic Games, so we are just looking at photo finish now. Uh, I'll leave you 15 seconds more and then we can move on. Demografia, klima i energia. Demographic changes, climate changes, and energy are definitely the leaders stopping. Three. We are going to screenshot this so we will compare it with the final voting that will take place at the end of the webinar. Today with us, 
We have excellent panelists, and we will discuss with them as to what this means for Bosnia and Herzegovina. We spoke of mega trends. We narrowed down to seven mega trends, and uh, according to European demography, climate change, and energy, uh, are leading mega trends uh, that are relevant for Bosnia and Herzegovina. And we would love to discuss this um, with local panelists. Uh, in terms of their expertise uh, and their position and views and forecast. With us, we have Professor Dr. Azra Haji She is a professor at, at um, Faculty of Economy at University in Sarajevo, Professor Dr. Mitar Perisic, Professor at the Faculty of Technology, uh, Zvornik, uh, East Sarajevo University, and Dr. Tarik Hubana, uh, Chief Operational um, Director, uh, RT Analytics, dealing with the AI. I'll ask our panelists to briefly introduce themselves, uh, briefly, two, three minutes. Azra, you can start. Allow me to greet you all. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Uh, I want to greet you all and to express my pleasure to participate today uh, at this webinar. And this is so interesting topic. This was my focus in my education uh, at the um, fellowship program when I was um, dealing with the forecasting of future and trends. Um, uh, I mean, I have to note that it was in the last century, though, um, we were reading the report submitted to uh, Roma Club, and I cannot but feel by hearing the introductory presentations by our esteemed pan, uh, key speakers when I was dealing with the future projections and compared that time and this time, um, I uh, tried to draw parallels between those two. I'm full-time professor, um, emeritus, uh, and I'm an economist uh, by vocation. I deal with ma macroeconomy, European integrations, and international economy, economic diplomacy. Those are the um, fields of expertise of mine especially economy of Bosnia and Herzegovina and various influences, outside influences uh, that um, impact Bosnia and Herzegovina, and we will talk in details about it later. Thank you, Professor Hadji Ahmetovic, and now Professor Dr. Mitar Perusic to briefly introduce himself. Thank you, Sasha. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and see you. I want to greet you first and foremost. Every new conference of this form is new experience to me. I don't know what to add to what Sasha said. I'm a full-time professor at the University of Istočno Sarajevo. I'm an engineer of technology with a vast experience. Uh, in engineering, especially also in strategic planning and generally of the development managing concept. And I've been um, um, cooperating with many international organizations for years, but I have an opportunity to learn something new today and hear something new today. And this is a, a rare opportunity to do so. Thank you. We will have an opportunity to um, learn something new from you as well. And our final panelist, Dr. Tariq Hubana, please introduce yourself briefly. Good afternoon. Uh, greetings to everyone. I'm Tariq Hubana, currently Chief Operating uh, Director, RT Analytics. It is in Silicon Valley in USA, and I am the 
assistant professor in uh, Mostar University uh, teaching about the AI. I'm doctor of uh, electro energy, but the focus of my research in the last decade was on the application of uh, AI in electrical systems. But in the last years, I am um, detached from that, and I've been developing the models of uh, AI in um, application in all businesses. And we are preparing 10 patents for um, implementation of AI, and we have published several researches. This is it for the beginning. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation, and I will start this panel with the uh, questions that relate to microeconomy. This is the center of our activity, and it is really difficult to detach it from everything else. The first question goes to Professor Haji Ahmetovic. Um, there is an ambition in the sustainable trans transition and regional countries are aligning with the EU policies uh, whose goal is to be um, climate neutral economy in, by 2050. It impacts the economy of a country from various aspects. How do you foresee Bosnia and Herzegovina adjusting economically to use the new opportunities in sustainable development and to mitigate um, uh, environmental risks? First of all, I should mention that over a third, that we are uh, in a way in a period of transition, but more specifically, we are lagging behind transition for internal reasons. In response to your question, more specifically regarding sustainable development, especially uh, development of uh, energy and uh, electricity sector, I should say that if there had been sufficient political will and uh, there had been sufficient uh, awareness uh, of the need uh, for a just transition, we would have been in a much better position today than we are. I should uh, uh, stress the energy sector in particular because it is still one of uh, the uh, development, potential development sector, one of the major chance for development uh, uh, with a focus on uh, clean energy. We have missed uh, multiple chances on many occasions. And can we do this? Yes, we can. We will pay a major price for this delay. We will uh, have to pay this uh, cross-border taxes uh, due to the inefficiency of the public sector and the lack of commitment to reforms in the public sector, including uh, electric power companies, the key, the three key companies. We've come to a position that uh, we they are operating at a loss, although we were one of the major exporter of electricity, not because uh, we had major production for expert, but because of uh, the low level consumption, the whole economy sector was, uh, has been very weak uh, over the past few decades in the post-war period. I should uh, particularly note that there is no sufficient awareness about the trends uh, which we have uh, uh, recalled now, especially those which affect the key sectors of, the, of Bosnia and Herzegovina's econo economy, including the energy sector, but not only energy sector. I should also mention agriculture, food sector, 
the effect of climate change on what we hear is very prominent uh, climate change uh, on the tourism, then health issues and health challenges we have had recently. And then we had uh, an opportunity to acknowledge all our disabilities, all these advantages and flaws the corona crisis and uh, i should uh, particularly mention the economic aspects of this crisis and we also should mention the political changes and geoeconomic changes which uh, affect bosnia and herzegovina especially when we speak about the integration of bosnia and EU integration of bosnia and herzegovina we have a very fragile economy for several reasons, for a whole range of reasons. And I most uh, flaws in our economy are the result of our attitude towards our economy and towards the challenges we face. But we do have a chance, regardless of weak human capital, democratic uh, challenges, uh, brain drain. But I think we still have a critical mass in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which could, could focus on addressing these key challenges in an entirely different way than we do currently, when the current political structures do currently, uh, particularly in the past decade. As for the trends that uh, we have discussed, and I could agree with the votes and the order of priority as a result of the vote. But I should not uh, just focus on the energy consumption. I, I should uh, rename it into energy sector. I cannot help but mentioning that I would have a problem to prioritize myself, but I could agree with this prioritization. I, 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 we are aware that Bosnia and Herzegovina is currently facing the demographic challenges, but we will pay the price in the near future as a result of migration and the aging problem in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Of course, this will shape economic activities, which I think no one has in mind currently. No one thinks how to respond to this demographic changes and how to shape uh, the structure of the key sectors. Also, we have uh, multiple chances in digitalization in service sector, but equally, we have to face our economic uh, constraints and uh, we have to address key social issues. As for climate change, I should say that uh, some 10 years ago, or more than that, that uh, when we um, uh, conducted a survey for the e uh, European Commission, uh, which uh, identified the Western Bal Balkans as particularly critical and the market with red color, because the projection then was that climate change will affect uh, the sectors which are crucial for the countries of the Western Bal Balkans, such as tourism in Croatia, agriculture, the tourism, energy sector, Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina also. And I should also mention that despite serious warnings, the attitude of uh, responsible officials, not only in Bosnia, 
in other countries was uh, superficial. They did not engage deeply in the decision-making process and they lacked serious approach in efforts to mitigate the problem and alleviate the consequences and to pave the way for a better future. And another point that uh, I would like to make uh, are the two trends among uh, the ones we discussed, economic growth and uh, geopolicy, and uh, it, the influence of geopolicy. As for the economic growth, uh, perhaps on a positive note, I should mention some potentials for Bosnia and Herzegovina. A few days ago, I had an opportunity to make this point when we discussed uh, the growth plan, which is uh, a new initiative of the European Commission, uh, which provided uh, financial support and injec injection to instigate and to boost this growth in the region. The growth plan, which among other things envisages that we can double the growth of uh, GDP in the next 10 years. This uh, caused uh, discussions and uh, criticism, and people ask uh, how much do we need to grow on a level, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, was uh, identified as uh, uh, utopia. When we discussed the first indicator, Bosnia and Herzegovina stabilized in early 2000 uh, at 5 to 6 percentage of growth. Then we had uh, energy crisis, corona crisis, economic crisis, everything that uh, struck us uh, recently. But surprisingly, in 2021, we again had uh, over 6% of growth. That's the second year of the corona crisis without any support of the government, symbolic support, yes, but uh, nothing significant. And our real sector, our private sector, in particular, not the public one, successfully responded in a way which was surprising for all economic analysts. It is still surprising, over 6% of growth in a year when it would be normal to operate at a loss. But I mentioned this as an example that when we want to do something, we can do it. We are able to do this. Bosnia and Herzegovina and its population, especially the young generation, human capital, surprise occasionally with their force and power. But our handicap are the circumstances which are beyond the sphere of economy, but unfortunately they affect economy adversely. And they affect all these aspects uh, uh, which on which we need to focus. And these are the, uh, the, the issues uh, of inflammatory political discourse uh, and uh, its uh, impact uh, on the representation of Bosnia and Herzegovina on our commitment to a better future, on addressing the key issues, facing the challenges. And uh, my colleague Hubara will probably speak more about a very important area, and that's digitalization. We are involved in digital digitalization resolution of uh, uh, the United Nations. We are we are in such an awkward uh, uh, working in such an awkward circumstances uh, 
in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we live and work in an environment uh, which hampers uh, our commitment, and we can do that. Just briefly to conclude, the economy is fragile, there are multiple internal problems, and, and, but there is a, a large room for improvement. Uh, there is a way to improve things and political commitments to work towards the specific goals, to use chances, not to lose them, and to discuss just transition. That's what I heard from you. You, uh, the, the aspects of democracy, good governance, some uh, megatrends are threats to democracy, Demogra demography, demography, I apologize. Digitalization can be a positive megatrend uh, which uh, will have a positive impact. Human capital is very important uh, and the uh, real sector has proved as a good partner in everything. That was a brief summary. We can uh, uh, move to the next panelist, Professor Perusic. Your expertise uh, is environmental protection and climate change. How climate changes that impact other countries and possibly regionally and globally can impact Bosnia and Herzegovina? In what ways Bosnia and Herzegovina is vulnerable? to climate changes than other countries due to large globalization. And um, if, for example, if we have a lower crop yields, um, the supply chain will be affected and it will affect Bosnia, for example. Can you reflect on that? One thing is what is happening in Bosnia, but the other thing is how how global changes are impacting Bosnia and uh, where is Bosnia most vulnerable? Thank you, Sasha. I would like to add to what my colleague was saying. Bosnia, Bosnia and Herzegovina is a part of the international economy. Economy of Bosnia and Herzegovina is very fragile and sensitive to all changes at international market. And therefore, any change, including climate change, is impacting our country. We should know that export-import ratio is 50-60%. So it uh, exports one-third and exports two-thirds of goods. And it's the same matrix that can be applied in the food sector. Um, fluctuations at annual or quarter level are small. We should also know what are the biggest foreign trade partners to this country in food sector. Those are EU countries, but especially Italy. Turkey and Serbia. So if we look at them as three biggest trade partners, we know that each of these countries are sensitive to climate changes for various reasons. So these climate changes on global level can reflect on a labor market in Bosnia and Herzegovina. First is because of the availability of certain products, and second is the price. That availability from international level and we spoke about uh, whether we have more or less of certain products in Bosnia, 
Um, it's because they are more or less in quantities in their origin countries, but local demography and the changing demographic changes is that is boring for this country and it can impact the food production in this country but the prices also play important role in terms of climate change influence on bnh market and bnh citizens Energy market is especially interesting in Bosnia and Herzegovina. At annual level, according to official statistics, imports 1.6 million tons of oil. So we fully import oil. And if one liter is less than 2 km without excise, we are speaking about several billion convertible marks that citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina must pay annually. So this energy sector impacts the food sector in Bosnia and Herzegovina, especially in terms of transport. We are spending, we are consuming 80, 70 percent for transport and only 7 percent is used for industrial production. But food sector is sensitive to transport, but also locally to our production. So oil and import of oil impacts the food production in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And what impacts any citizen in Bosnia and Herzegovina is the price of these products. So we have a nominal growth, as mentioned by Azra, and nominal growth is 9.9%, whereas the price of the key produce went up for more than 20-30%. So it affects the budgets of ordinary citizens. So citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina are getting poorer and poorer because of these global trends. The question is how, how to break this vicious cycle, given that the BNH market is leaning and focused on import. We have to improve the local, local agriculture, and then long term, we need to decentralize the energy production. Every agriculture household should produced as much energy as they can consume. Of course, this sounds like utopia from this point of view, but by taking small steps, we can see significant results in the near future. Thank you so much. This is very interesting, and it all leads to economy, directly or indirectly, because it's the center of our activity. Very interesting conclusion about improving local agriculture. This is something that uh, we saw as well um, with contacts with the local community where we thought that the other topics will dominate, but agriculture is very important for the economy of BNH. Decentralized energy production is something that is future. 
but uh, it's only the question when we will start implementing um, this trend. Question for Dr. Hubana, third panelist. I have to admit that I did not uh, vote uh, at Menti, uh, but uh, I made it, but the first uh, one that I would choose uh, would be connectivity, hyperconnectivity. Statistics show that by 2013, uh, 90 percent could read and 60 percent will uh, have access to internet globally and it really shapes our life um, very quickly technology technological development uh, will impact private and uh, private life there are positive and negative aspects to that of course but what do you think would this mega trend uh, have mostly positive impact and help socioeconomic development or would have negative impact and would be seen as a risk uh, for creating political instability, um, uh, aggravating inequality, and maybe even um, undermining security in Bosnia and Herzegovina? Thank you for the question. The question is very good. But I doubt that I can provide you with direct answer because hyperconnectivity and uh, fast technological change has impact on Bosnia and Herzegovina and will have impact on Bosnia and Herzegovina. But it will carry both positive and negative uh, in, um, consequences. Dr. Carson mentioned so many things that are very applicable to BNH, but I will try to um, focus on few. Positive effects that we see are better employment rate, especially IT sector development and freelance industry, which is um, uh, leaning on hyperactivity. It can help uh, economic growth in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have experts here in the country uh, in IT and other freelance industri industries. And um, better connectivity enables easier access to global markets. And therefore, we have these sectors developed. And before, they couldn't be on that level, of course. But the other important factor that I would uh, underline connected to the first one is easier access to education and knowledge knowledge in general. It can be accessed at internet platform. We have distant learning already, um, and it is um, implemented by the uh, um, hyperconnectivity and access to digital platforms. So the market is the entire world. Digital literacy as well, where the workforce is being improved and upskilled and the citizens are more resilient to the market changes. With these positive effects, there are negative effects as well. As you said, political instabilities through spreading of um, disinformation, misinformation, uh, through internet and it can increase political polarization, destabilize society and all the other factors that Professor Haji Ahmetovic mentioned a few minutes ago. Cybersecurity falls under the same group. If you connect everything and if you have this hyperconnectivity, you automatically increase the risk for all cyber attacks and we uh, jeopardize the critical infrastructure and we uh, heard uh, several times that it's an energy sector in Bosnia and Herzegovina, energy infrastructure that can be subject of those hyper, uh, cyber attacks and can impact political security. In social element, I would emphasize digital gap and loss of privacy that we all witness um, because we are so exposed. Uh, Differences in the um, approach to technology can aggravate social inequalities. Those who have access have more opportunities uh, for education because of the digital education platforms. They have uh, better access to jobs and employment. 
and those without access can be marginalized and left set aside. Increased digitalization can um, risk your privacy, especially if the regulation for data protection is not developed, and this is one of the aspects that needs to be improved in Bosnia and Herzegovina, data protection. So when I need to evaluate whether it's positive or negative, I will tend to go more positive, but uh, we need to additionally invest in cybersecurity and education and regulation that will protect citizens to maximize those positive impacts and uh, uh, stop overshadowing those uh, positive impacts. Thank you. Uh, you summarized everything that has been said, so I would uh, not add anything from my side. It was all very clear for the purpose of um, going along with the agenda. I will have one more question for each panelist, but please stick to the two, three minutes allotted time so we can have time for coffee. Question for Professor Haji Ahmetovic. We are talking uh, about decrease post post economy, different models, uh, how realistic this is and what needs to be changed in the current political uh, economic system in order to make it functional. What indicators should we have and uh, how this would fit into uh, the traditional growth measures? Thank you, Sasha. Your question is so important that I don't know how to uh, fit this into two minutes, but I'll try. Recently, on several occasions, uh, I uh, found uh, texts uh, that intrigued me, the economy and the functioning of the growth economy and the warning that we should uh, uh, get uh, uh, used to the uh, degrowth economy. And I'll uh, just focus on the region and Bosnia and Herzegovina now on this occasion. Of course, we do not uh, expect um, more uh, any in, in major increase in our growth. In order to balance the disparities, among the countries in the region, and especially with uh, EU members, well, the whole region is just 40% of the European Union uh, based on the GDP indicators. Bosnia and Herzegovina is uh, at the third of the EU. So we need to do much more and much faster in order to decrease uh, this gap. But uh, it is beyond any dispute in economy, in general terms, not in Europe, in our country or region, that everything changes to such an extent, I do apologize, that everything changes and that we need to uh, count on not growth, but development, which would include uh, individual segments, including the growth in a, in a different way. We are past uh, uh, a high rate of economic growth in Europe and elsewhere. That's past, uh, in this term, we should forget about the prosperity we had at the uh, uh, brilliant years of uh, globalization and development. But what matters now, I think that when you mentioned the types of indicators and 
what we can use as measurable indicators or alternatives to the current indicators and what we need to change in our economic system. I think for the countries uh, such as Bosnia and Herzegovina, it is particularly important to have several interventions. First of all, uh, entirely different education, reform of education with a special focus on skills. Everyone will understand all people from here, especially our colleague Kubana. And I, what is another thing that is very important and uh, which make us fragile are the strong institutions which we lack in Bosnia and Herzegovina. They should be sufficiently able to mitigate the external shock and to respond faster to all the challenges, to be more efficient, to respond to challenges we are facing and we will face, especially in the uh, reforms we are implementing. When we speak about the indicators in economy, we have uh, these measurable indicators such as uh, per capita income and GDP. Are they relevant for us? We all agree that they are not, but we still don't have uh, other. What is important for Bosnia and Herzegovina and the countries, uh, countries? We don't have uh, the picture of uh, our population. We don't have a social map. We, we don't have an insight which is a elementary requirement for us to be able to design key policies for the current time and the future. I, I do apologize, I'm beyond two minutes, and uh, but this uh, answer was still scarce. Thank you very much. This is uh, indeed an interesting topic. Perhaps uh, we can discuss uh, this topic more in depth in future. A uh, short question for Professor Perisic. Impact of climate change and degradation of environment on Bosnia in future. Could, uh, uh, we, uh, what do you foresee? What, uh, how this will happen in future? There is no doubt the climate change uh, uh, has been felt in Bosnia and Herzegovina in recent year, especially our generation. Let's take uh, the impact of uh, the 2014 floods. They left uh, permanent damages, according to the then estimate, both in Republika Srpska and the Federation, the damage uh, was estimated at about 1 billion euro each. And uh, if we transfer this to the entity budget, that's five years of uh, their own capital investment. This is only one effect of uh, climate change that existed for 15 years and brought our economy back for four or five years. If you use common sense, we should conclude that we need to have pre prevent such incidents. Climate change in Bosnia and Herzegovina can have long term effect. It is difficult to foresee what could happen, but we should make an effort to shape the future in such a way to prevent the, ver the worst from happening. We should take the lead of the process into opposite direction. It is obvious that we have maximums in terms uh, of droughts, uh, precipitation, heat waves, uh, health of our cattle, 
we had the emergency situation in Posavina area where certain these emerged among the cattle. We have economic instability, we have continuous social pressures and uh, negative migration balance. Now, if we look at all these facts, we see apocalyptic images, but we have faced over the past 20 years with each and every individual impact of the climate change. We cannot say with certainty that each of these impacts was directly caused only by the climate change, but uh, they had certain influence. Uh, there have been different scenarios made for Bosnia and Herzegovina. Bosnia and Herzegovina has a national climate change uh, plan uh, until 20. 24. And I think uh, the focus of this plan is on the agriculture, but we cannot envisage or, or foresee with certainty that the precipitation will, be, uh, uh, will have higher rates or uh, low rates, but uh, we hope that uh, they, we will not reach a maximum and, uh, and uh, torrential floods. The climate change in Bosnia and Herzegovina can have uh, unforeseeable, unprecedented impact in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Perhaps this is an anecdote, but one of the major EU politicians said that 90-90% of politics is economy. And uh, I, I don't think even this 1% uh, is an exception. Whatever approach we take, we need to be uh, uh, systematic and uh, fully implement the legislation, rules, regulations, uh, in order to avoid uh, the adverse effects uh, of climate change in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you very much for this concise answer and the interesting statistics uh, about the cost and damages to the budget. It makes things much clearer in terms of the need to act urgently. And the last question for Dr. Kubana. I will use uh, this opportunity. You are an expert in two areas. One is artificial intelligence, uh, but you also are an expert in energy. And I feel free to ask you to briefly respond how these new policies which aim at climate uh, neutrality and uh, uh, and uh, phasing out fossil fuels how they will impact the policy in Herzegovina. I will try to provide a concise answer. I should say at the beginning that Bosnia and Herzegovina is a signatory to the Paris Agreement and many other agreements, and we are champion in signing agreements, but we are backing uh, behind, uh, lagging behind when it comes to the implementation. In the energy sector, the most important agreements are stabilization and association agreements and uh, energy uh, tre uh, treaty agreement, we committed to harmonize our legislation with the EU regulations. We should be honest that we are, we are working on this, but this sector is so dynamic and uh, it changes so fast that we are always lagging behind. Now, if you look back at the situation in the field, we should see that uh, the energy transit, uh, transition is shaped by another trend, and that market, uh, uh, our legislation does not uh, follow the market changes, and the majority of small producers of the energy abandoned the uh, 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 subsidy uh, scheme because uh, market offers better price. Without uh, guarantee of origin, they cannot guarantee that uh, new energy comes from RES. Uh, professor mentioned the uh, uh, introduction of CBAM taxes. Uh, 
our mix, uh, which uh, contains mainly coal, uh, will not be profitable. Our main uh, uh, public company and uh, production in Bosnia-Herzegovina will be damaged by this. It, we don't have energy exchange in the region. Other countries uh, have this exchange or are working to establish it. New forms of energy, such as wind parks, will not invest in Bosnia and Herzegovina, although the potential is huge. But there are certain requirements that we need to meet in order to attract investments. In order to keep step, we need to harmonize strategic and legal framework with the EU regulations, and we need, uh, need to allow our energy and private sector to take part in the energy transition. Fortunately, technical and financial resources are available either from EU or other countries or Bosnia and Herzegovina, but they should be used smartly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Kubana, we have one question in the Q&A uh, section. I will read it and ask uh, for answers. Which mega trends are the most interesting from the agricultural perspective? Can we have one example of positive and negative mega trends point of view of impact or more or less the major and least uh, impact uh, for Bosnia and Herzegovina from uh, for agriculture and for Professor Hadji Akhmetovic to say a few words about uh, green bonds. As for the agriculture sector, the major mega trend is the demographic aspect, the negative demographic trend in Bosnia and Herzegovina. In simple terms, we don't have sufficient farmers in Bosnia and Herzegovina. If we were, I'm not an expert uh, in agriculture, but uh, in my experience, uh, in my cooperation with uh, a local self-government unit, if we could have uh, uh, relevant and accurate data, we would see that the number of small farmers which produce for their needs uh, is decreasing and the number of farms is decreasing. I'm not speaking about major farms uh, which may be used to satisfy uh, some uh, uh, local or uh, governmental subsidy. There is no doubt that the main and the primary megatrend uh, affecting uh, agriculture is demography. Of course, um, uh, in connection with other megatrends, we cannot say one is uh, more important than the other. This is a very complex uh, system. Every megatrend relies on another megatrend. When we speak about digitalization, it's clear that improved digitalization and communication did not change only the way of communication and how we communicate, it changed the way how we travel, how we make appointments, how we have holidays, how we book hotels, how we procure. And one mega trend which uh, engendered change uh, changed all other sectors and areas. And let me come back to the previous one in. Uh, agriculture, all mega trends have impact, but uh, we, we need to see what is impacting the most of the farmers, and that's Thank you very much for this uh, explanation, Bon. Let me uh, uh, reflect on the agriculture. I'm an economist. Uh, I'm not directly engaged in agriculture, but uh, it is not uncommon to hear in our country that there is huge potential in agriculture, especially in some regions in Bosnia and Herzegovina, 
But from the point of view of mega trend, uh, of which you reminded us at the beginning of this uh, uh, webinar, first of all, we should know that we don't know exactly how much agricultural land we have available. Recently, I read the data. They have started to do this agricultural census, but we are using only 20% of the agricultural land we have. So we do have uh, something which can be used. But certainly, this is not about the agriculture. Uh, uh, that uh, we uh, were we were told about. Uh, if you don't uh, study well, you will uh, raise uh, cattle. The agriculture is uh, a part of the economy. They need incorporate climate change, energy, uh, aspects of uh, energy consumption, and energy is important for the uh, agriculture also. Given the limited time, I will focus on green bonds. It's a part of the whole narrative about green finances, green economy, including the green bonds. They deserve special attention in the European economy for the simple reason. I will underline it as a development strategy when the European Commission launched Green Agenda and then uh, Agenda for Western Balkans and provided financial support. Some so energy, some agriculture in this green term, some third sector, but I want to say that we had the wrong approach and understanding. We should have introduced the change in every sector, financial sector, in the bank sector, bank that would financially support the transition by the loans and stimulate digital the changes in digital agenda this stimulates something that um, jeopardizes clean life and pollutes envir environment and so on. Sara said in her presentation, and I apologize if I got it wrong, but I believe it was Sara. And it is very important in Bosnia and Herzegovina and countries such as Bosnia and Herzegovina. It, this is, we need to encourage the culture of thinking of the future. And when we speak of this concrete green bonds, they are um, integral part of this economy. And we need to change the way we think. In future, we need to think about each action and each of us how able and what opportunity we can seize to be a part of this huge puzzle, which will lead to the final impact or, or, or change. Mitter, my colleague, spoke about important segment. It pertains to environment and pollution and so on. We do not contribute to global pollution. We are too small of a country, um, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Western Balkan, but we are not that small when we pay very high price of pollution. I live in Sarajevo, for example. And in last few years, we've uh, been uh, topping the list of most polluted cities in the world, and nobody is 
is asking themselves, why do we um, keep jeopardizing the health uh, and future of these and future generations in this country and in this city? Um, regardless of our symbolic participation at global level, but on this smaller level, how can we contribute to change this pollution that is very tangible? You can see it with your bare eye during the winter um, months, um, like in Zenica, Tuzla, and all the bigger cities in Bosnia and Herzegovina who have been so polluted that you can see it with your bare eyes and this is the consequence of omission to act of um, failing to do something and i apologize if i exceeded the allocated time no it's fine thank you uh, ayla please help me do you see more questions in, in q a chat we have another one it pertains to what sector will be at most risk by megatrends we are discussing today. So if you think this question is too wide, we can leave it for later. We can leave it. It will be similar discussion during the third session, so we can uh, touch upon it in the last session. Because we are beyond our agenda now. Do you agree that we just uh, take a very brief uh, pause to get a coffee or uh, water and get back in a few minutes? Just a few minutes. Yes, I agree. OK, now it's 12.09. We'll start the session 12.15. Yes. So we are coming. We heard. Sad sam pomešala početi na švedsku, ma možda neki mađarski izmene na kraju ove. No, I mixed the languages. I will start speaking Swedish or Hungarian. Welcome back to our last session of the webinar. We open a number, a range of interesting topics. And now with my colleague, Sara and Markus, we will try to have some answers, what we can do with that and how can we respond to the megatrends uh, at the level of policy making. Uh, I hand over to my colleagues, Markus and Sara, and I will rejoin you at the end of the seminar for conclusions. Very good. Uh, thank you, Sasha. And uh, Sarah, if you can bring up the slide starting on session three. Absolutely. Here it goes. Just tell me if you can see it. Perfect. Great. I'm going to take that earphones out because I'm hearing an echo. Uh, these two pictures, uh, you might wonder what, so what's this all about? 
but it's um, the English version of the slide it says considering how we can steer these megatrends. And I think the word steer might be a little ambitious. Uh, maybe better to think in terms of influence, but these two images represent different kinds of megatrends and different opportunities to engage. And the key question for the, our third session here is how do we engage with these, both in analyzing where the leverage might be and what the megatrends are actually doing, uh, whether we need to, we can actually influence it or we just need to get out of the way. So if you, if you look at the picture on your left, of the sheep, you'll notice up in the corner there, there's a there's a sheep dog in the background waiting, watching the sheep to make sure that if they start to stray, that the dog gets up and does its does its job and keeps them all together. Uh, you could call that steering or influence, but what that suggests is that there's there's a readiness and an opportunity uh, to influence those sheep to stay together in this cluster. And some of the megatrends look like that. They're, they are more, you could say, more adaptable to our interventions than others. If you shift over to the, to the image on the right, uh, it looks much more serious and threatening uh, and requires a little more analysis to decide what to do. So if you were positioned on those tracks, you need to decide, first of all, is this train sitting still or is it moving? And if it's moving, is it moving fast? Because in, in that later scenario, you would just want to get out of the way. If it's sitting still, you might want to wave at the, at the engineer driving the train to say, don't start this again until we're able to fix the tracks. Uh, so they're very different. The megatrends are very different in nature. And you could say, for example, that climate change is much more like this train, although it's moving slowly and accelerating. Uh, there are other megatrends that we mega trends that we have more a direct influence over because they're they're all about what people do that aren't sort of built into our energy systems the way that climate uh, pollution is. So if we can go to the next slide. There we go. So what I'd like to do is introduce a little sociology into the into the picture here. Um, in order to navigate these, obviously, even the list of megatrends that we presented earlier has to be prioritized. Uh, and we're going to invite you to come back and prioritize it again after having heard our experts discuss some of the nuances of those but it's impossible to deal with all of these all at once. Um, the second is that in prioritizing them, we need to systematically go in and, and look at some of the features um, that influence how those megatrends get steered, even without planning. Um, and one of the, I think, interesting elements there is that Azra mentioned that we need to change our way of thinking, that culture, the way we think of the future is an especially important one. And I'll, I'll come back, you see on the top of this under belief systems, that also would include culture and the way we think about the world, how that influences our behavior. So we'll come back to that and talk a little bit about how, how we need to, in, in assessing how we engage with these megatrends, this is one of the crucial elements that we need to consider. And to what extent can we influence how people think about the problems that we face? And the other two elements here, we'll, we'll go into a little bit more detail. And then the third, which came up repeatedly in, the, in our expert presentations, is how some of the synergies and conflicts, how these elements from the different megatrends interact with one another and either reinforce one, one another, as in the sort of synergies, some of which we want to engage with, and conflicts um, between them. So we will come back to the, to the middle one and talk a little bit. And then I would like 
for us to engage our experts a little bit in thinking through, thinking around this triangle as agents of change and how do we think about this, these questions of belief systems and thinking and culture? How do we think about social networks, the groupings of people in society, uh, the organizational structures that, that uh, engage with these questions, either to support change or to oppose it? Uh, who are our allies, for example? And then the third one around policies and institutions and how do those structures steer what we can do, uh, what we maybe can do, but with more difficulty and how do we, um, what what changes do we make, need to make there in order to, to facilitate the kind of changes that, that need to take place. We'll come back to that and do one more round. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, this again, I will, uh, well, let, let me go ahead and, and uh, take a tour around the corners of this. In the middle of the triangle, we have the, all of us who are engaging in responding to these megatrends, whether it's in reaction or an effort to actually get ahead of the curve and try to, try to influence or even, in the best case, steer the course of, uh, of these trends. So the, the first thing that's important is the way that we perceive these, how we define our problems, what we value and don't value, how those belief systems uh, influence what we define as a problem or as an opportunity. And one of the first things we need to think of is the, what we believe actually influences our behavior uh, very much in the way that I was referring to, that it's the, the culture and how we think about the future that sets our goals and what we value uh, exceedingly important. The second is policies inst and institutions, which are a, a form of um, expression of those belief systems, but that are given force in law and an organization structure. So the rules and regulations, the, the laws that uh, steer what we can do and the economic incentives that are built into those that, uh, for example, might still subsidize uh, coal production, uh, or maybe you know in other cases subsidize or incentivize the uh, the development of, of uh, clean energy. But those kind of rules, where we need to engage in policies that 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 make it easier for people to act in constructive ways, and harder for us to act in ways that are problematic. And then the third, again, is this social networks or constellations of social actors that engage either to support those kinds of changes because they see them as necessary or as opportunities, as beneficial, or they see them as disadvantageous for their particular interests. And that we need to map those and understand where those are. And after we've gone back through and reprioritized these megatrends, uh, we're going to ask our, our panelists to walk around the corners of this triangle and think in terms of specifically around the probably just one of the megatrends. What are the belief systems that, that are important here and are there changes in the way we think that need to take place? Then the second is the policy and institutional changes. And the third is in thinking about these changes, who are our allies? So I'll, I'll touch on that one more time uh, as we start, and then we will ask our panelists to engage. And then if you have specific thoughts uh, that you'd like to enter into the chat, uh, please please do that. But first, let's go back to the megatrends. And the Mentimeter here. coming. Maybe it's coming. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So the we should get the uh, 
code. The code there. Here, just a minute. And then you can Sarah, if you move the slide forward and back again, that I could can be try that. Yes, okay. let's try. Okay. This is the results from the previous round. Am I previous? right? Yes. Yeah. Sasha, do you think you need to open the question again to the participants? No, maybe I should share or let me, I will post in chat the Menti number. And if this, uh doesn't get us where we want to go, we can uh, revert to the original scoring. Mm -hmm. I think. No, there's nothing I can do at this moment. <laughs> let's, uh, let's assume that the input from our panelists uh, left the order of the sequence largely intact and added some important nuance to those things. Um, and that would suggest then that climate change and demographic change would be the two top priorities to engage with. Is that a fair assumption to work with here? So let's, I would let's say work, so, yes. Let's work with climate change and then we can do a round with demographic change. So if we, if, if Sarah, if we can go back to that triangle diagram. And I'm just as a re reminder again, this is a this is all about how people often in people in organized groups, not as individuals, engage with the kinds of changes that these trends represent. Uh, so, so it's really about three key categories and these categories structure our behavior differently uh, and they don't work in sync with one another, which is why we separate them into three. But the first is again, belief systems. How do we define our problems? and our opportunities. The second is how do we how do we concretize those beliefs into laws and rules and regulations and in institutions? And the third is how do we organize ourselves with others who who share similar interests and goals and values? And how does that influence our opportunities to move forward? So if I were going to take climate change, I would say the, the obvious distinction around climate change is that you'll see some, uh, some people in society who see climate change as an opportunity uh, to move to someplace that's more beneficial, for example, reducing air pollution in Sarajevo because we're using other energy sources would be one of those things. Um, and a second element would be maybe we need new regulations to support that, new incentives. And the third is where are the allies and the, the opponents? Uh, so taking climate change as our um, as our example or as our mega trend to engage with, let's let's bounce this bounce this over to our experts for three to four minutes to just sort of walk walk around the triangle and think if you're engaging in directly trying to move this in a desired direction. How do you see the belief systems, the institutional changes that are needed, and who are the allies in the region who can step up and help help to shape those changes? Uh, and maybe we can go in the same, the same sequence. And I apologize for using uh, first names, but I grew up in a very informal culture and I also have an easier time pronouncing first names than I do the last names here. So if we could start off with Azra to take just a couple of minutes and think through this 
circle and maybe to start with your uh, earlier observation about the importance of culture and thinking of the future and how we need to change the way we think. And I'll put in my headphones so I can hear the translation. Sasha, no go ahead. Marcus, can you just shortly repeat the question? No, no, sure. No. Yeah. So the question once again. Just the For uh, for each of our panelists, but to start with Azra, is in thinking about climate change as the mega trend that we want to influence or at best even steer, we have three different social structures to grapple with. The first of which is how we think about the problem, how we define it, how we uh, think about the opportunities and problems that come with that. The second is rule changes, institutional changes that we need to consider that will facilitate the change. And then the third is who are our allies in terms of organizational constellations that we can engage in the region or outside of the region who could step in and support us in moving those changes along. And also, sorry to put you on the spot for the first, but you were already so good on the thinking uh, part of this. And it, from what I heard you describe, you're, you're already quite uh, well-versed in thinking about these, these three spaces. Thank you, Marcus. And I agree completely when you speak of climate change as one of the most significant challenges. But I cannot but remind of three observations by yours, by, by you three priorities. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's very difficult to narrow down priorities because everything's priority here. And maybe in the context of climate change, we need to underline the, the, the connection between all megatrends. We cannot focus only on climate change and not think about demographic change, about economic growth, um, energy transition, or vice versa, any other megatrend or problem that we might select. But concretely, to answer your question, and the eternal triangle, I believe in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in our region generally, maybe even broader, we face the problem of mistrust into institutions, mistrusting institutions and the system. And I believe that's something that deserves a, a separate engagement and a feeling adapted to these times and challenges that we face, how to motivate, how to encourage people to progress, to reform system, to change something, while having the trust in the institutions and the system. This is something that we need to think of. When it comes to the policies of institutions, I underlined the fragility of, of the economy in Bosnia and Herzegovina, including, of course, the institutions that we don't have or don't have strong enough institutions to respond properly to the challenges we face. And the third element is a network. Maybe I'll say something 
surprising, but that's the least problem in Bosnia and Herzegovina because with the lack, uh, with, with, with the absence of the trust into institutions, we created a network that made us who we are. And sometimes we, we, we were brilliant uh, in certain aspects and um, positively surprised ourselves and others. When we speak of any mega trends, but in this case, climate change, everyone needs to understand what their role is in tackling and mitigating this problem. And everyone needs to understand their own role. There is no segment uh, in this society that uh, can be out of this engagement. Um, family, uh, upbringing, educational system, political institutions, social institutions, uh, um, um, workplace, those are all segments uh, that are impacted by climate change. We cannot only say that climate change will impact only agriculture or um, anyone else. It, 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 it impacts everything, economy, work time, working hours, social life, uh, um, relationships, uh, the way we communicate with others. It impacts everything. And I listed several things that but I believe um, trusting institutions is something that needs to be paid attention to, as well as strengthening the capacities of institution. Great. Thank you very much for, uh, especially as some impromptu uh, use of a another framework here. I wonder uh, if we can engage Mitar next a little from your perspective about how those three elements uh, separately and together influence our, or how you would think of those in an effort to influence the course of climate change. Well, Thank you, Marcus. It is very difficult to provide you a simple, simple explanation, but I can give you my personal position regarding those three elements, policies, institutions, uh, social networks, and people and their beliefs. We, start, we have to start from the decision makers. We need to create policies in a way or strengthen the capacities of institutions in a way so that the people can change their beliefs from we can't do anything into we can do everything. So when you change that constellation uh, between the decision makers and people and those who, who, who vote for these decision makers, um, we will change a lot. Of course, a social network contribution or broader the social correspondence and networking should be used to share positive practices. What we managed to change, the results we managed to achieve, let's share with others so everyone can see that, so we can close this circle or PDC circle. We can do better every time by sharing these positive results. We underestimated the significance of social networks at, at certain point, but we see now that it is huge, significant. But first and foremost, we need to 
improve education starting from primary to secondary and higher education to explain the significance of megatrends and insert that into education in order for us to change the habits. Maybe we as generation are too late to change our habits or not. But in future generation, in order to change their position and their interaction with the environment and the nature, what is not our private property, but a common property, is something that needs to be involved in education system as well. And we cannot leave anyone behind. We need to involve all stakeholders. These laws and regulations um, prescribed so much, but it only meets the interest of certain individual groups, groups or private groups. We need to involve all stakeholders, reach general consensus about very important issues, especially include academia, NGO, and again, all interested parties in order to improve the existing state of affairs and decrease the negative impact of future megatrends. Even those who are not known to us now, but will appear after 2050, for example. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? Or? Yeah, and I would like to highlight how nicely your description actually captures captures the interaction between these three different kinds of structure that Thank you. social networks influence the extent to which we trust institutions, uh, that the people that we associate with influence our belief systems, and that those things together influence these megatrends. So they're all connected and the, the importance of being able to break out individual elements isn't that we deal with them separately, it's that we think about them separately in depth and then put them back together again when, when we have to take action. Um, and I think that links very nicely back to Osra's observations. Yeah. May I just say something, small thing, please? Marcus. Yes. We're striving to reach zero net by 2050 um, as global community in Europe, but nothing is preventing us to, at local level, municipal level, um, set our own little zero. And it can start with having zero of those in our municipality um, with the restricted access to food, zero of those who lost their lives in traffic accidents and so on. If we set up small local zeros that we want to achieve at local or lower level, there is no doubt with the, we can achieve the global zeros. Absolutely. There was a uh, well-known politician in the U.S., Tip O'Neill, who talked about all politics as local. Uh, and that taps into that piece of wisdom very nicely. So thank you. I wonder if we can bounce over to Tariq, but I, I'd like to shift the question just a tiny bit because part of what, uh, obviously energy is a key part of the climate issue, uh, but the other is to what extent does the development of AI, especially as it moves up this ex exponential curve in, in the rate of change, uh, to what extent does it either get in our way of grappling with this or does it provide a support for us to change our thinking or to augment our thinking and problem solving capacity? Okay. It's perfectly clear, don't worry. I believe that 
AI jeste, dakle, Your question is very important for AI. It is a very important process of helping us in resolving many issues. Uh, we can lean on belief systems uh, pertaining to this issue. Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and globally, people um, think similarly uh, about the AI. Some see it as uh, uh, as, a, as uh, something that will uh, make them lose their jobs, and some will think it as something that will help them resolve the issues uh, of future. When we speak of uh, AI, we think of, or most of us think of robots walking around, but it's more than that. I mean, it's already intrinsic uh, element of our life. Every time when we leave the parking lot, the the machine reads our plates automatically, or um, when we use our iPhone, um, AI is involved. It is there to facilitate the daily tasks. How uh, institutions can help us? They can improve digital uh, infrastructure to um, make the uh, internet connection faster uh, so that the AI can support the standard process. It can help uh, the development of human resources and STEM education, where we need to increase digital literacy and so on. In BNH, BNH we are doing that already because of the market and because of the opportunities offered by the highly paid sectors, especially in terms of encouraging the entrepreneurship. This is the phrase that we hear very often, but I will give you one example. Scientific work that made a revolution is attention is all you need. And it came out as the result of research. But the concept enabled the application of GPT, a language model. It has an open AI, and many of you um, met with this uh, concept, and it's worth $80 billion now. So this boom is taking place globally. It can also happen in Bosnia and Herzegovina. What can institutions do? Additionally, they can um, adopt regulations that will strengthen the privacy data, uh, provide cybersecurity, strengthen the capacities to protect the key infrastructure that I mentioned is one of the problems. And what is very specific for Bosnia and Herzegovina is, is um, data center infrastructure. AI chips use a lot of energy and the um, growth uh, trend is uh, 25 to 30 percent annually. This is a huge number. So it means that in very close future locations that have energy infrastructure that can uphold that with hyper-connected location will be very soon after combination. Bosnia and Herzegovina can be just that infrastructure that is um, outdated from the old system is there, the prices is um, there, strategically is hyper-connected, and in that context we can uh, focus uh, to become a strategic position. Social networks, international institution, EU can be our allies, uh, UN, the World Bank, and all the others, but I would uh, underline private sector as well. Technology, tech companies can uh, offer their knowledge and their resources. Most of these companies in Bosnia and Herzegovina is um, mo uh, mostly doing that for Western countries and USA. So those are experiences that are used by institutions that think forward and they can use it. And of course, academia that can and have to be directly linked with these researches and that can bring um, change and do huge things. So every listed step can help BNH to use the opportunities, especially uh, in the time of exponential growth of AI application and turn these threats into opportunities.
passando. I don't hear anything either. Hello, can you hear us? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I'm not hearing it well. Good. Well, let me thank our panelists for impromptu sort of stepping in and using a different uh, model and using it very skillfully to identify some some levers in the, in the in the region. It would be, I think, extremely interesting to have more time to dig into it in depth. We are at the end of our time. And so I would pass back to Sasha uh, for either the wrap up Megatrend uh, Mentimeter, if that's possible, or for, for simply wrapping up since we're coming to the close of our time. Thank you, Marcus. I should note that we have two brief questions in Q&A, and uh, I kindly ask uh, the panelists if they have time to answer these questions. The first question is for Marcus. Which are the main three positive megatrends that uh, should be followed and used? I would love to be able to answer that. Uh, I think I don't have the expertise in the region to be able to identify which ones are the most important for Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, I, I did mention before, I think climate change is one of those enormous um, trends with lots of inertia that if we don't turn it soon, it'll be too late to turn it without really major consequences. And that also, of course, connects to the other megatrends as well in terms of opportunities to shift our energy production to methods that are cleaner, that opens up new jobs, um, those kinds of things. So I, I think I would identify that as a key one, but we need to engage where we have our own particular expertise and we need to do that in collaboration with other expertise because these issues are really quite too complex for even small groups of people to to work on successfully thank you marcus hvala uh jedno još thank pitanje you, Another question, how can we ensure that citizens have a, a more saying uh, on selection and implementation of trends because parties uh, after their election forget who selected them? Is it possible to answer this question at all? But uh, perhaps we should try. Any panelists? Well, I will try. At the point when the citizens realize the power of their pen during the elections, and everything that comes after the election, and uh, if they understand that they can sanction those who did not understand the power of citizens, but, and we are still a toddler, we have still toddler democracy, but at the point when we understand this power of citizens, uh, everything will pick up. Thank you, Professor. I don't see any further questions. We had a comment on the Facebook that Bosnia and Herzegovina should be ready 
to uh, face the sudden climate change, uh, change of high intensity. If we monitor the uh, statistics on climate, the uh, precipitation has been stable. Of course, we should monitor the global trends and prepare in a timely manner. This is uh, just a note uh, which was uh, a place uh, posted on our Facebook channel. I just read it. Thank you all for active participation. I thank our dear panelists, my dear colleagues from SEI who were with us today, to all the participants uh, from Bosnia and Herzegovina and neighboring countries and Sweden. This was indeed uh, an interesting discussion which opened many new questions. It's difficult to summarize the discussion, but perhaps uh, I, we have three major conclusions. The first is that megatrends mega as such have both positive and negative sides. They can be risks and threats and opportunities. And it's up to us through our engagement, through adaptation and uh, use utilization of these opportunities uh, to design a, re a re relevant response. This is important for Bosnia and Herzegovina as individual country, but also other uh, governments, political commitment, political accountability, and the political readiness to react and respond. The institutional building, the trust in the institutions, and uh, in, uh, empowering citizens and increasing their role in the decision-making process and uh, taking the ownership by citizens. And the third point is that thinking about future is important, necessary, and it needs to be increasingly integrated in our planning process. Our, our plans should not be a document at an end, but continued process which should be refreshed, revised, uh, uh, repeatedly. Thank you very much for today's discussion. I hope it was interesting and useful for you as it was for us. Now I will uh, announce the, the next interesting uh, webinar uh, focusing on transformative planning. You will receive information about webinars soon. Before we part off, you will uh, receive just an information, you will receive a link with the recordings of uh, the website. You will receive it in a couple of days. And uh, please uh, do not hesitate uh, uh, if you have any further questions uh, and if you want to continue discussion on your other questions. Thank you very much and have a good day.